Welcome to the Coach's Table Podcast, where coaches come to grow personally and professionally through real-world application and online education. Today's guest, man, I think you guys are going to learn a tremendous amount from him. Um, I think it's he's got so much to share on a multitude of topics, um, and I'm super excited and super um, ex- just excited for everybody to, to listen to him because really, I think he has a lot to offer. So today's guest, coming all the way from Canada, Coach Tanner Kerr. What's up, man? Hey, buddy. How you doing? Good, bro. How about you? I'm good. Everything's good. Life's good. That's awesome. Hey, for those of you guys that don't know um, Coach Kerr, he's he's in Canada. Uh, he's our neighbor up north. And you know, here in the United States, I think we typically only think about the United States. But um, man, he's got a lot to offer. So let me just kind of tell you a little bit about him in, in just a second. So Coach Kerr has coached 27 All-Americans and five national champions. Now, I don't know about you guys, but not many strength and conditioning coaches get the opportunity to coach that many people at such a high level. Um, and even from his beginning is that he started at a high level at professional levels, um, working with pros right away. So if you would kind of share people or tell people your story, kind of tell us a little bit about yourself, how you got started in strength and conditioning. I always think it's so interesting uh, when people kind of say why they got into the industry. Yeah. So, I mean, first of all, thanks for having me on. I really appreciate the time and I appreciate the platform and I was uh, really excited to hop on. Uh, in terms of kind of like how I started, um, very similar to other SNCs, it was mostly about exploring my own athletic uh, endeavors um, where I grew up in Burlington. So basically just just west of Toronto, basically. I was incredibly fortunate, um, even at the high school level, to be surrounded by people who um, were fairly highly regarded in Canada when it came to speed development, SNC, and all these things. So uh, just to kind of expand on that a little bit, like my high school coach, for example, was working in the CFL. He was working at a high performance institute in Hamilton. He was working at uh, a local university and doing everything that we're doing now. Uh, and I had that available to me pretty much at the age of 14 onwards. Now, yeah. I wanted to um, grow as an athlete, obviously. And for me, that meant getting into football as soon as possible. Uh, I basically played every sport under the sun growing up. Yeah. But I really, I really wanted to play football right away. And it was actually my, my pops. He told me, no, grade nine. I said, I'm signing up. He's like, no, you're not. You're, uh, you're too fat, dude. You gotta, you gotta cut the <laughs> weight a bit. <laughs> so basically fast forward a year, dropped 30, 40 pounds. So I, again, took the onus on myself, learned how to do that. Whether that be the training piece, the nutrition piece, whatever. And then I go, okay, grade 10, here we go. We're playing. He's like, no, nope, you're, uh, He's like, you're too pencil neck now. You gotta, you gotta add some lean mass onto your frame. Ooh, like, shh, I gotta learn how to do that now. Fast forward yeah. another year, grade yeah. eleven. He's like, no, you're, uh, you're too slow, man. You gotta learn how to get fast. <laughs> so it, it, in a way, my, my kind of introduction, because I had such phenomenal resources available to me at a young age, my kind of introduction to SNC was fairly early, but my uh, football journey started very late, and then within that time frame. I was able to get um, a bunch of scholarship offers. I had a I had a good career uh, playing up here in Canada uh, for university, and then uh, basically it came to a crossroads where, unfortunately, um, I got uh, another head injury that I wasn't necessarily planning on, and that interrupted my my draft journey a little bit. And it came to uh, kind of a crossroads in that regard because I had to choose whether to get drafted or kind of take advantage of an opportunity I had where. I would be interning under uh, two former pros who own their own business, who were affiliated with a CFL club up here. Uh, and I decided mm-hmm. to do that. So basically upon graduating, um, really within, I'd say the first month I was, I was working with pro guys uh, with multiple wow. sports. I was working at a private facility and really just kind of um, having a heavy load when it came to the mentorship stuff. So yeah, that's kind of in a nutshell, how, how it came about. That's crazy. Um, for, it's crazy because athletes spend, and I'm going to just, you know, look at football here, but athletes spend their entire lives essentially training to be a f- college football player, right? As you know, we yeah. play football from five years old, six and, and all the way up. Right. And then you get those one or two years, you know, maybe three years um, or four, it depends on your school level, but you get a couple of years to like really shine and be like, okay, I can, 
I can play at the next level, whether that's a division one, whether that's, you know, division three, it doesn't matter. But, you know, we spend so long in trying to get a couple of years and here you are, you know, you come as a, a, a 10th grader, a 11th grader, sophomore, junior, and you're like, hey, I'm just now starting. And you spent three years training, which I think is good, but then bad right at the same time, because, you know, part of you is kind of like, dude, I just want to play, <laughs> right? Like you went Yeah, a hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, a hundred percent. I was just, uh, I was really fortunate to the, to have the coaches that I had and they were able to get me up to speed fairly quickly. But in a way, if we are going to kind of segment that into even this youth development, I think it was actually a yeah. really good thing for me, not only from like the knowledge side, but also just having, uh, having played basically every sport under the sun prior to that specialization. And in a way, I'm, I'm really thankful for that. I'm thankful for that yeah. journey because I was able to do track, baseball, all these different things uh, yeah. before I kind of chose my, my one sport I wanted to really get into. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And that was the same for me. So I played pretty much every sport growing up as well from football, basketball, baseball, wrestling, uh, track, uh, did gymnastics for like two years when I was like five or whatever. Um, so I think it's, you know, from a youth developmental standpoint, I, I benefited tremendously from a multitude of sports. Um, you know, I was a pretty average player, got a scholarship, um, you know, did that aspect of things, but I developed my athletic skills by playing a multitude of sports. Um, and that exposed me to a multitude of movement patterns that exposed me to a multitude of things because you see it now in whether you're a football player, basketball, doesn't matter, baseball, right? If you take I'm just going to use this example, but if you take a football player and ask them to go play basketball, a lot of them don't even know how to shoot a basketball. If you take a football player and ask him to go hit a baseball, a lot of them, their swing is so bad coordination wise. Um, you know, everything from that standpoint, it's like, but yet you're this absolute stud on the field from a, a football standpoint, but overall athleticism, just the ability to rotate, the ability to have intermuscular coordination is like, it is not there. Um, in these other contexts. So it's really interesting to me. Uh, I'm an advocate of youth athletes playing a multitude of sports. Play them all, yeah. you know, as long as you can play all of them. Um, and you look at guys in the pros and, you know, some of the best players in the pros were multi-sport athletes that played two or three sports throughout their high school career. Some of them even played two or three in college, primarily two, but which is insane, but it's crazy. So interested to hear your thoughts on youth development then. Yeah, I mean, I think even because you and I are both in the collegiate landscape, I think even the way recruitment is going now, it's like a lot of, depending on the philosophy, obviously, but a lot of sport coaches will kind of uh, opt for this, the, the sport. Uh, the kid who will play multiple sports rather than who will yeah. specialize right away, which up here in Canada, obviously, uh, kind of hockey is our, our main sport. And I think it's kind of a shame that kids at – the age of three, they can't even walk yet, they, but they're, they're on skates right away, skates, right? And yeah. I get the receiving end of that sometimes. Like certainly when I was working more of in the private sector before uh, where I'd be working predominantly with hockey athletes, just like the amount of overuse that I see, the amount of just compens uh, compensation patterns and just even like how, how they're kind of robbed athletically in certain ways because they went hyper-specific mm -hmm. too early. So yeah. I think now we're kind of starting to see a little bit more of a shift where certainly at the collegiate level, coaches are opting for kids who can play a wide array of sports or overall they demonstrate just being a robust athlete. Yeah, absolutely. I think having being a robust athlete is extremely important. Um, and then having coaches that can help you get there too. Um, and yeah. a lot of coaches really don't even know and understand what that means, but we're using the sport of hockey as an example. And speed training right hockey and speed training is very interesting because the guys on skates um you know the repetition that it takes for you to skate um is, is tremendous obviously but then if you take them off skates and you say hey just sprint it is so mind-boggling what you see and you're just like from the arm action from the leg action from how wide their feet are it's just like Okay, we got to go to step one. <laughs> What's your experience like with that? With hockey guys, speed development, what does that look like? Oh man, they're just like they're just so externally rotated. I'm just surprised that oh. they, I don't get three, four, five hamstrings at a given speed session. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, obviously, now that I'm 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 out here in British Columbia, I'm I'm not uh, I'm not working with hockey players as much as I 
I did when I was in Ottawa, certainly, but it, uh, it was quite the uphill battle. And really, I think when I was working with hockey players more so, I think that's when uh, kind of the mentorship and the education process learning from Cal Dietz was so important to me because that he talks a lot about uh, certainly how inadequacy of foot strength and ankle stiffness mm. can kind of go up the chain, change your source of stability, change your angles, change your posture, all these things. And you here you have an entire sport that is predicated on being in a boot all the time, right? So yeah. kind of seeing that transition to on land and doing speed development and doing all these things off the ice, we kind of get the receiving end of of all that, of the the years of hyper specificity with hockey players. So it's really interesting. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Right. And you go from, you know, just sheer uh, amount of contact, you know, from the actual foot to the skate is, you know, reduced tremendously, right? Like, there's not much there. And I skate. I grew up in Minnesota. Uh, so we played pond hockey. I don't know if you're familiar with that. You guys probably are if there were, you know. Yes. Hey, everything freezes. Go outside, shovel it. And we're playing some hockey. Like, that's how I grew up. Yeah. I didn't actually. Honestly, I, I consider Minnesota as part of Canada at this point, to yeah. be honest. Yeah. <laughs> A hundred percent. It's so funny when people ask me because they, they're like, oh, you're from Minnesota. I'm like, yeah. And they're like, so Canada? And I'm like, no, but yes. I mean, <laughs> it's crazy. But Southern Minnesota. Okay, guys, Southern Minnesota, but um, you pretty much Canada. It's cold, super cold. Uh, we like our hockey up there as well. So, But actually really interesting. So you don't work with hockey players now, but I'll tell you what, it almost seems like there's a sport that you – like you. It seems like you work with every sport. So he's at Simon Fraser University, which, if you guys don't know, is the only NCAA university in Canada, right? And yep. it's him and one other guy. He works with over 300 athletes in a multitude of sports. And I'm talking not just small sports, but big sports as well. So from basketball, volleyball, track and field, soccer, wrestling, and it's you and one other guy. From a time management standpoint, how do you guys kind of do that? Because coaches now are becoming really specialized as well, right? And we want to work with one team. We want to work with maybe two teams, right? Um, and then some coaches get seven, right? And we want to work with smaller teams that, you know, we're more specialized in workload and all that stuff. But how do you guys kind of manage 300 athletes, two people? What does the day-to-day -day look like? Kind of walk us through that. Well, uh, so yeah, like you mentioned, it's myself and Chris Robertson. Um, him and I had a really close relationship uh, even prior to getting this job. So uh, he was at Rugby Canada previously. Uh, the university I was at prior to here, um, I was working predominantly with rugby athletes. So him and I worked very closely together. So if he was working with high school athletes and sending them up to the collegiate level, we'd be uh, working together on that. Conversely, if I had an athlete on the collegiate level who are nationally carded, maybe they're going to Olympic trials and things like that, I would send them his way. So we were really work together quite a lot. And that kind of worked really well here because we have an excellent line of communication and we're very organized. So like you mentioned, there's two of us and there's about 450 to 500 athletes at Simon Fraser University. Um, wow. So like you mentioned, it's in the United States of And we basically go about our day um, in the sense of just kind of splitting it in half. So he'll do all the teams from like a six till two. And I'm there basically from anywhere from 10 to 11 to about seven 30 at night. Um, and like you mentioned, that kind of consists of wrestling track, volleyball, basketball, uh, and soccer. So uh, I got my handful. So I think yeah. having, I think having online software kind of like team builder, for example, um, mm -hmm. is kind of a godsend in that regard because it allows sure. us to be very efficient um, in our practice and stuff like that. But it is kind of a struggle in, in the sense of just trying to make sure the quality is where it needs to be, trying to individualize where we can, try to bucket athletes where we can, give them what they need. So um, it's yeah. kind of an uphill battle in that regard, but we, we try to do our best. Yeah. And if you guys don't follow him on, on social media, and particularly probably Instagram, I would imagine, but you do a great job of bucketing athletes, of understanding, okay, Hey, if they are lacking this quality or these qualities, um, here's kind of our measurements. Here's kind of, you know, what we look for to say they're a speed individual or they need more speed or they're a power or whatever. How have you kind of uh, made that your own? What do you kind of utilize? Just pick one sport and say, okay, I know I've seen a lot with you in track um, and then some other sports as well. But how do you kind of say, hey, this person needs more speed. This person needs more power. This person 
how do you guys kind of individualize that with so many athletes and how do you bucket that? Well, it really comes down to just first and foremost, just reverse engineering the sport. Um, my general training philosophy is mm-hmm. um, enhancing the athlete and complementing the sport first and foremost. Um, I find that if you take a fairly general approach um, outside of anybody who's basically a freshman, you're mm-hmm. getting a kid who can't walk and chew gum at the same time to do some fairly basic stuff. But outside of that, I think understanding the demands of sports and how to complement certain kinds of athletes is imperative to uh, their success and how well you're executing your program. So um, I do that with pretty much every sport that I do to a certain degree. Um, yeah. So just with one example, um, basketball. So I'll do something as simple as like an explosive strength deficit. I'll identify who are my more fascially or elastic driven athletes versus my muscle driven athletes. And I'll mm-hmm. try to complement um, from like an individual standpoint in that regard. So you need a little bit more reactivity work. You need to improve your overall strength and go from there. Basketball is incredibly difficult in that regard because you have such interesting bodies, though. Now, with that being said, I might I might have an athlete with an incredibly long wingspan who I deem that they need more reactive work. However, in season in particular, I try to keep boots on the ground as much as I can uh, based on the sheer minutes that they play in training camp and and in competition, obviously. So I'm trying to stick to the philosophy of they need more reactive work, but I'm trying to keep boots on the ground. And I usually can't opt for an Olympic lift or their derivatives because of their wingspan, because they're kind of at a disadvantage in that regard. Yeah. Because if I, if I had them go to high hip, but their wingspan has that bar at low thigh, then they're kind of behind where they need to be, obviously. So I have to find <laughs> fairly creative ways to, to go about doing that, which and I, that kind of goes into like a special exercise category. Um, sure. That's kind of one way of tend to bucket athletes. Um, another one is just if we are going to be talking about basketball, it's yep. certainly just based off of minutes. So I just look at minutes yep. played and I will prescribe a designated session for whatever day we happen to be doing. And then I'll have my, my athletes uh, execute the volume based on the minutes they played. So what our Monday might look like, for example, we always play Thursdays and Saturdays. Monday is always a regen day. So we will do some form of monitoring and then we'll do an EDT. So just a a recovery circuit. So if I have an, if I have, let's say three or four girls playing above 30 minutes, for example, they'll do singles for six minutes. If I have somebody who's generally 12 minutes to about 18 minutes, I'd say, I'll have them do doubles for 10 minutes. And then if you're a low minute player, so under 10 minutes of playing time, I'll have you do uh, triples for 10 minutes. So that's just an easy way to kind of bucket them based off their load so that we're kind of reaching the overarching theme of what I'm trying to do, but just accommodating them based on what they're playing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I bucket athletes pretty similar as well. Uh, basketball in regards to minutes played, um, you know, high minute guys, moderate, and then low. Um, And then I just give them very similar to what you do as well. Just a range though, because at times, like, even though you're a high minute guy, there's times where like they feel good and it's like, well, maybe I want to push it that day. Cool. Awesome. And there's times where maybe you're a moderate minute guy and you feel like trash. Well, like, okay, let's back off, you know, because for me, it's like the number one thing is especially in season is like you being available to play your sport. Like, yep, I still want you to improve. Yep, I still want you to push weight. Yep, I still want you to jump maybe a little bit. Um, But my biggest thing is, like, you got to be fresh. You got to be ready to play. And so you guys monitor once a week. Is that what you guys do then, like, on a a Monday, like a daily wellness questionnaire? Or is that – how's that for you guys? So we do everything objectively. Um, I'm not a huge proponent of um, doing like RPE uh, screenings and stuff like that. So basically what my week will look like is I'll have a regen day on Monday. Uh, They train on Wednesday. That'll be our perform day. And then our Friday is going to be our turbo day Um, with Friday being kind of an interesting setup where I'll usually do some kind of inverted session organization. So instead of having our primary stimulus being kind of smack in the middle of that designated session, I actually give them their accessories first and then Mm. basically end the session with the highest outputs, the most excitability type movements uh, so that they, from a nervous system standpoint, feel good going into their game the following day. Uh, But basically from a monitoring standpoint, Monday will just look like your basic CMJ. I might break out the grip dynamometer. 
um, and wow. some some fairly basic stuff like an IMT people, for example. And then our yep. on our perform days, that's going to be our special exercise category where we're measuring power outputs. So for me, that will consist of a trap bar shrug, uh, our push jerk, and then our split jump. Yep. And then I basically pinpoint their peak powers and I tend to bracket it. So I'll give them different exposures based on where they hit previously. Sure. Wow. Um, actually, one thing I'm interested for you to talk about then is the grip aspect of things. Um, I've thought about that myself because I would love to take that like on the road and um, assess it like the day of game and be like, okay, like what is your central nervous system readiness? Now, am I going to take that information and then go run to the coach and be like, so-and-so is not ready. He's not playing today. Like, absolutely not. Um, <laughs> but more so just to measure to see, okay, if we had, you call it a turbo day, I call it a primer, um, probably the same concept. But like, if we did that, on Friday, we believe that the it's gonna the effect of it will still have an effect for at least thirty six hours afterwards. That's kind of the the thought process. Twenty four yeah. to thirty six hours afterwards is what we believe will still have the neural effect. Let's actually test that. Let's actually see like does that work? I don't have the grip strength one. We have four stacks, and so we just do kind of movement jump on that. Uh, we test that twice a week. Um, and we do that the day before the games, actually. So, like, if we train on Friday, we'll test it on Friday. We've been going Tuesdays and, and Fridays uh, for when we test their kind of movement jump just to see, like, you know, hey, where are we at on that? You know, we do, like, the hands-on-hips component of it. But I would love to get um, one that I can go on the road with and just see, like, just just see. Like, we're doing nothing with the data, but I'm just curious of are we still getting a potentiation effect? are we even getting it? What does that look like? Right. So, um, yeah, I don't know. Have you noticed anything from it? I mean, with the grip dynamometer in particular, yeah, yeah. to be honest, not much. And yeah. for me, it, be it, it became kind of an issue when it came to like understanding the standard deviations of like, when do we need mm -hmm. to have a conversation versus like, um, what I deem to be acceptable. Um, sure. because really especially in the ncaa like it's these kids are kind of in a pressure cooker and their their readiness very much changes from a day-to-day -day standpoint so um i would use something more along the lines of like a jump and a pull rather than a grip yeah. dynamometer that's something that i had implemented earlier um when i first got to sfu that i've mm -hmm. since kind of backed away from because i really kind of tend to question the validity of it sure. um to be totally transparent but yeah, I think I think the the turbo type stuff is fantastic in that regard, but I think different people respond to different stimuli, you know. So yeah. for me, I the way I tend to accommodate that is just giving them autonomy. So what I'll do at a designated session is I'll give them three different potentiation clusters and allow the athlete to choose. So one of them might be like a bilateral cluster, one of them being unilateral, and then one of them being kind of like an AFSM type. And what generally happens is the the athletes choose the cluster that they generally respond best to, that they like the most, that with, is generally going to bode well for me because I'm getting the outputs that I want in that regard. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah, that's something I really enjoy doing too. And they're more bought in because, you know, they say, okay, you know, today I want to do a unilateral component of it, or I feel like I get more from this, so let, let's do that, right? Um, and yep. someone will say like, Hey, I feel like I get more from the bilateral component. So cool. Great. Like, you know, awesome. Yeah. And I think that's like, that's kind of like a, a marker for success for really any coach is when you start to implement a little bit more autonomy in my programs or your programs. So for yeah. example, if I have an athlete come up to me and it's a turbo day and be like, you know what, like my SI is a little stiff or my back feels a little stiff. Maybe I won't do the bilateral today. Maybe I'll do unilateral. I'm like, that's a fantastic idea. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. This was a fantastic <laughs> conversation, right? Like that's what you're thinking. You're like, Great. I love that. Yeah. Yes, me too. <laughs> I think, and that's a huge component of it, right? Is so many coach and, and this is a very large generalization, but I think that so many coaches just don't have those conversations with those athletes. And what I mean by that is whether they're unapproachable themselves right? Or the athletes don't feel like the coach is going to respond. Well, whatever the case may be like, I just, Hey, look, man, put good effort in today. Like I've literally told my athletes that one time, like, I was like, I don't care what we do today. Just put really good effort in. 
Because if you put really good effort and intent in today, no matter what exercise we're doing today, we're going to get some sort of stimulus. And it was a day like yeah. everybody was feeling like really bad. And just like we took an L when we shouldn't have taken an L. And just like everybody seemed like, you know, they kicked their dog that morning. And I was just like, you know what? Uh -huh. Hey, if you want to do dumbbell bench, do dumbbell. If you want to do barbell, do barbell. I don't care. Just have intent. And the session was like 30 minutes. And it was probably one of the best sessions that we've like had because they were just like, I'm going to do what I want to do. And everybody kind of like took their anger out a little bit on it, which was great. Um, but you know, some of them, it's like, am I going to try and force you to do this today when like everybody's just not feeling it, not feeling the vibes. And, and I was just like, you know what, if you want to get an arm, yeah. pump, get, an arm get an arm pump. Cool. You know? Oh, well, I mean, arm, arm candy is certainly a remedy for low morale regardless of sport, but okay. I, I think that's I think that's something to kind of expand on in a way because I feel like certainly now with the the era of the NIL and stuff like that I feel like the the coach yeah. player dynamic in a way is kind of changed because SNCs we've kind of always been a neutral party kids tend to open up to us a little bit more than a sport coach because yeah. at the end of the day we don't dictate playing minutes to a certain right. extent right um so generally they're going to be a lot more comfortable telling us really what's going on versus uh, their sport coach so. I think, I think in that regard, the a changed relationship of the NIL is kind of interesting. So you almost got to treat them like pros. It's like, mm. how are you feeling today? What are you feeling today? What do you want to get in today? Oh, you want to do a back squat instead of a front squat? As long as it moves at point eight, I'm happy. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, to an extent, honestly, right? Um, that, that's very true, right? I remember I had a conversation when I first got here and it was like, your one job is to not get this player injured. And I was like, well, I don't plan to injure anybody, but <laughs> um, okay. And they're like, he's our, he's our guy. He's our stud. He's, you know, the guy and he's so good. Um, but I was like, cool. Right. And it's like to that point though, they're like, yeah, like kind of treat him like pro a little bit. Right. Um, I mean, he's still going to do everything that's asked and required. Cause he's, you know, he's a dog like that, but um, it was like, Hey, He's, he's our guy, you know? So that was really cool. Um, speaking of NIL, I had a conversation yesterday and I found this really interesting because I think you do some unique stuff with this. So NIL for players to get paid, which I'm a proponent for everybody getting paid. Um, I think everybody should get paid. I think everybody should um, do as much as they can to make as much money as possible. And I say that wholeheartedly uh, because money is what makes the world go around. And I think in this industry, we don't talk about money enough and we don't talk about business enough and we don't talk about coaches expanding their skill set um, to make more money. So very interested because we talked a little bit about like your daily, uh, like what each day looks like for you. And you spend a couple hours every day doing like business development. So would love for you to kind of expand on what business development projects you're working on. Um, how are you continuing to um, increase your revenue sources, whether that's through the university, whether that's outside the university, what does that aspect look like for you? And why should coaches, um, kind of like a three part question, but why should coaches partake in the business aspect of things and expand their revenue sources? Yeah, so hundred percent, I'm willing to talk about that. So I think before I get into that, I think just a little bit of context first, I think understanding kind of the landscape of S and C or sports performance in Canada is, is definitely worthwhile. So for us, we don't have necessarily like five SNCs per mm. sport. Obviously we just talked about um, there's myself yeah. and one other guy for 500 athletes here. We have to do our best with that. But um, I think it's a benefit in that regard because we have to be kind of like a jack of all trades. So we have to be the, uh, we have to be the leadership component. We have to be the SNC. We have to be the applied sports science. We have to be the speed, the speed guy. We have to be the strength guy. We wear many hats, right? So, with that being said, I think that gives us an array of skill sets that are quite valuable to a lot of people. So uh, when it comes to the business side of things, I think uh, in terms of my day to day, that's something I think I want to expand upon in the coming months. Um, one thing I didn't mention is I'm going to be having a kid in July. So yes, congratulations. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very much planning on expanding on that in the coming months. So um, really what my day-to-day -day look like, looks like until I go to work, which again is around like 11 a.m. Um, I'm up early and I hop on a lot of consultation calls. I do a lot of 
uh, one-on-one stuff with sport coaches, with practitioners, with physios, with chiros. Um, that could be facilitating um, calls between parties. So if a physio is disagreeing with uh, a sport coach, for example, it's uh, having a simple conversation along that just so that they can be on the same page. But really, it's just educating and refining everybody's practice around me, uh, which mm-hmm. is ultimately my goal. I'm trying to kind of raise the standards for everybody um, across the landscape. Yeah. So I think having the kind of jack of all trades approach is really valuable in that regard because we can teach sport coaches, oh, listen, if you want a sprint type drill, but your work to rest ratio is like a one to one, we know as practitioners that your quality is going to continue to diminish. So that could be a simple conversation of like, you need to have optimal work to rest ratio. Here's how you can facilitate that in practice. And here's what it might look like, right? Mm -hmm. Conversely, um, there's a lot of other uh, practitioners like physios, chiros, uh, certainly even personal trainers who really can benefit from our wealth of knowledge. So um, my mornings are usually spent on consultation in that regard. Um, So that's something I've really enjoyed doing uh, because I do like, like yourself, like helping other people. And then in the coming months, um, I'm very much trying to expand my practice within the education landscape. So that'll include running seminars. Um, these, this last year has been very much uh, in person, but I'm going to be focusing more on online resources in the coming months. So mm-hmm. I have a level one and a level two. I'm going to be doing a speed one. I'm going to be doing a return to play one, and I'm going to be dropping that in the coming months. So I'm uh, looking forward to doing that. So. I'm really just at the moment working on refining those things and, and turns on how to like market it the best and, and get yeah. the most amount of people involved. Yeah, absolutely. So for, for those that don't actually understand how much goes into a seminar um, or the marketing aspect or setting up um, a place for people to, to pay online, to watch online, to um, you know understand all the resources that go into this, like these skill sets of marketing, copywriting, putting the obviously the presentation together um, and then the email aspect of it and then following up with people and then collecting the revenue sources. Like those skill sets are skill sets that like legitimate businesses pay hundreds of people to do. If you guys want to be a hundred percent honest, right? So understanding how do I build a website <laughs> or what software system do I utilize? There's so many out there. Am I using Squarespace? Am I using ClickFunnels? Am I using Wix? Am I using, and then taking the time to learn that skill set. And then saying, okay, well, like, what content needs to be inside of that? What does the sales copy need to look like? What does the headline need to look like? How do I, you know, structure this so people will, you know, actually pay for it? How do I, you know, send people to my website? So now you're talking about sending traffic. Now, what are my conversions? And now maybe ads, maybe, you know, like there's so much extra to it, which are all amazing skill sets, like amazing skill sets, because I don't know if, any many strength and conditioning coaches know how to do that stuff. And it's like, I mean, I certainly didn't. (laughs) Yeah. But how did you learn just by doing it? Right. Just honestly, I hated it. I, I prided myself on being the excellent service guy. I was just going to focus on training my athletes, Mm -hmm. doing the best I can. And kind of of like, shoot, I don't know about your parents, but my parents certainly is just like your quality will be rewarded somewhere down the line. But as we know, that kind of landscape has changed too. We, we see it more than ever that people tend to hop jobs more and will immediately get a 10 to 20% pay bump based on where they hop to. Um, yep. And you, you very rarely hear people staying in the same place for a prolonged period of time and getting, and getting that same benefit, right? So yeah. um, I think for me, it was, it was a fairly challenging experience of just having that kind of paradigm shift going from, okay, my service is going to be rewarded. I, w- I just want to be uh, kind of like a landmark in the industry. Hopefully one day I want to make a massive impact. I want to have a uh, really rewarding success with my athletes, certainly. And something will come down the pipeline when in reality, if, especially if you're a young or aspiring SNC, you have to start making opportunities for yourself. And I look at somebody like an Eric Cressy, for example, he has, facilities, he has online resources, he has consultation, he has seminars, he has all these things, but yet he's also getting paid, what is it, like 1.1 or 1.3 by the Yankees, but he's in a position where he doesn't need the Yankees. Correct. Correct. Right? Like he can get dropped yep. tomorrow and he's, he's going to be, he's going to be okay. So I think having that security blanket is, is really, really important. 
I agree with that. And for me, and I don't know what the pay is like for you guys in Canada, but for a lot of strength and conditioning coaches, um, you know, the pay is just not there, right? You go and you get master's degrees. Um, you do internships for free. You move around the country a little bit. Uh, you probably do two internships and then, uh, you know, which are semester long or a summer, and then you get uh, a, a part-time job or a full-time job. And some of those part-time jobs or full-time jobs, I mean, you've probably seen them, but $30,000, $37,000, $40,000. And I'm like, yo, inflation's at the highest that it's ever been, um, you know, regardless of that, but it's at the highest it's ever been. And people's value is diminishing in regards of like what the universities are willing to pay or what somebody in the admissions component thinks you're worth, right? Which is really frustrating to me. And you have almost no ability to negotiate. Now, some of them you do, which I would highly recommend people do. But with that, and we can use Eric Cressy as an example, um, and I think that's fantastic. He's built himself other streams of revenue that if he lost however much he's getting paid by the Yankees, he's like, okay, well, I have five facilities in different locations. I have online, I have pros, I have now granted he's in the private sector space, but you could do this stuff at a public university. Um, you can absolutely do this. You can start training people online. I talked about this uh, yesterday in one of the other podcasts that I did, but what I would recommend anybody as a strength coach to do is learn the business side. Okay. If you're working with teams, tap into the performance bonuses. When you take a contract, say, I want to be part of the performance bonus. The sport coaches get that. You should as well. Why? Because you work with the athletes more than what they do. If you travel with them, if you do all this stuff with them, your level of impact has an impact on those athletes. Now people will argue, Oh, well, you can't affect wins and losses regardless, yada, yada. Okay, cool. Well, guess what? I still put the time and effort in to get these athletes prepared for, you know, whatever the case may be. And I'm part of that journey and part of that success. And if we do well, I should get rewarded for that. And if we don't do well, then I don't get rewarded for that. It's pretty simple. On top of that, I think everybody should train athletes online um, and learn that aspect of things. Like in all honesty, because it's another way for you to get paid. Right. It's another way for you to do that. I think you should start a business an LLC, reduce your taxable income. Right. And actually learn to like develop a business component of it. So then you can get paid more so you can stay in the position longer. Cause just like you said, people aren't staying at universities for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. They're staying at a university for one year or two years. And then they're going to the next place to try and get more money. Like that's why people are leaving. They're trying to get more money. Like that's why, yeah. you know? Yeah. And it's, it's really interesting. Cause like, obviously there's the, the private benefit of operating a business, but, um, even here in Canada, we're starting to see that within the collegiate setting, um, and high performance facilities that, um, yeah. they actually, and when I say they, I mean, administrators who, um, often have a hard time defining your role and your success. Yeah. Um, they are actually looking for business experience and business savvy because here in Canada, they actually are starting to want you to run a RevGen model. So mm -hmm. an example of that is, um, okay, let's say our collegiate athletes come in from 6 a.m. until 6 p.m. Great. How are we making money on evenings and weekends? Oh, you have GAs. Oh, you have uh, a tiered internship program where you have kids who are fairly competent in programming who can take care of youth athletes. Okay, let's talk to the private clubs. Let's talk to the high schools. Let's talk to all these things mm. and get them in. So now we can start making money. So really that in and of itself could actually be one, like that business savvy can yeah. really be the thing that can make or break whether you get a job within the collegiate setting now, certainly in Canada. Sure. That's really interesting. Um, so what about like the liability risk for that then? So I, I would imagine, and I don't know this for sure, but I would imagine if, you know, we try to do that at universities here. There's a liability risk component to that. If a high school athlete, if a youth athlete comes in and they're training with people um, that are hired by the university or that work for the university, and let's say, unfortunately, there was an incident, somebody got injured. Where does that liability component lie? Like, do you just make them all sign waivers where it's like, we're not liable for anything? Um, or how, how do you Yes, do I believe so. Yeah, like certainly... 
like certainly we're operating within a the university. There's a lot of red tape. There's a, a fairly long bureaucratic process that you just have to understand that uh, yep. whatever it is you want to do is is going to take a substan- substantial amount of time. And part of the part of that is because of liability, right? So it's something that they take super seriously. Um, and that is going to be in the form of a waiver. So in terms of like invoicing, the university wants their private person to be processing that in terms of liability. They have their own representative processing that. It's not through us, right? Uh, at least, at least where I'm at. Um, but it's just, it's interesting to see that, um, a lot of, certainly when I was younger in the field, a lot of practitioners were kind of, like you said, they would, they were very hesitant to talk about rev gen. They were very, t- uh, hesitant to talk about sales and marketing and all these things. Uh, yep. and they just wanted to be some kind of white knight who just trains their athletes. But, uh, again, I, I don't know how it is in the States, but the economy is where it is. Inflation is very, very high. And, Ultimately, yep. people have to take care of themselves, right? So that's that's yep. what it is at the end of the day. And honestly, it took, I think, uh, myself and my wife uh, getting in the situation we were in to kind of have that snap for me a little bit. So yeah, yeah, no, I mean, and that's really interesting because pain drives people, right? <laughs> like whether it's <laughs> whether it's financial pain, whether it's emotional pain, whether it's physical pain. You know, pain is a big driver for people, um, and that's why people purchase things that they purchase too, right? If you're, you know, obese and you want to lose weight, you might purchase, you know, whatever pill to try and lose weight because you're the pain that you're in is, you know, pretty incredible, whether it's internal, external, doesn't matter. But in regards of, you know, and I'm going to highlight financial pain here, but a lot of people do get themselves in a very tough financial situation. And then, you know, they look at how much they're making and they're like, there's no end in sight. The debt's piling up. I'm not making enough money um, and I'm only getting paid X and I'm working X amount of hours. How in the heck am I going to make any more money? And I have this skill set. Um, you know, I had a conversation with somebody and they're like, if I ever get fired from my job as an SNC coach, I don't know what I would do because I don't have any other skill sets. And I was just mm. like, Ooh, like, see, I would disagree with that though, because we, we can offer so many services that's, that just goes even just outside of online training. If that's yep. your, your prerogative, absolutely. You can make a, a killing with that. And there's been lots of proof of that. Um, mm-hmm. however, I think our impact can give you, can be fairly limitless in the sense of who our, our marketing customers are. So, uh, again, similar to what I was talking about, I think understanding how we can help sport coaches better their practices is invaluable because yes. again, if hypothetically we're, we're talking about the greatest stressor a student athlete can face, which is their practices, right? Yep. So if we can impact that, we're going to help impact their readiness, which in turn will effectively impact game day performance, which sure. can in turn impact injuries and wins and losses, right? Conversely, there's the physiotherapist component. If we can help mitigate soft tissue, all these other things, that means less hours are being spent on the table where physios can then be, or sorry, excuse me, athletic therapists can be more efficient with their time. Um, that is ultimately going to save universities or private organizations a lot of money, right? So I think I think the opportunities are fairly limitless. I agree with you there. Um, I, I, I really do. Um, it was just when I was told that, I was like, oof, like, mm, that's... I mean, if that's your thought process, that's tough, but you know, um, okay. So actually I want to expand on that for a second. So impacting practice, do you guys use any technology to impact practice? Um, cause I'll tell you how I do it, but curious on how you guys do it. Cause I'm curious how everybody else does it. But, um, I think getting those sport coaches to be open to the idea. Um, and I love my sport coaches just as much as everybody else. So it's not, I'm not dogging them. I just think because they don't know and understand that component of things at times, um, we spend a lot of time educating them or at least potentially educating them on, hey, this is the information from the athlete, whether we use technology or what. How do you guys kind of go about that? So here, um, very unfortunately, we don't have access to GPS. That is something that uh, we've been pounding the table for. Uh, Everything is set, but it ends up being... Again, a little uh, a little issue when it comes to red tape. Again, we're talking about like the privacy information of the student athletes, um, yeah. which is kind of the main reason for the hesitation. So, in terms of our practices, how we impact uh, practices, again, similar to what you mentioned, we give our coaches live information from our monitoring sessions, 
This is how they're trending plus minus. It could be very, very simple. It's like, this is what I'm seeing anyways. Maybe, maybe have them uh, participate in fewer minutes in practice today. Um, and generally, even from like a nervous system standpoint, maybe that's us interacting with coaches and helping them plan their practices. So if we look at their script, if they do script their practices, uh, you, you as a practitioner can look and say, listen, you don't have a high speed exposure for 10 days. You guys are at risk of losing the residual effect of speed development and sure. you are potentially at risk of having somewhat of a lar- lethargic performance Correct. when it comes to being on field, right? So that's, I think, from a day-to-day standpoint, is more about just understanding and effectively communicating how how their coaches can modify things to get the, the, the most out of their practices and the most out of their athletes. So then, because do you then sit down with your coaches and either help them play in practice or overview their practice or just look at it and say, hey, like, hey, what's your plan for this week? Well, like, is Tuesday a hard day for you? Is, is Thursday? Like, what does that kind of look like? Um, because that's kind of how we do it a little bit. And I can dive deeper into that, but I don't know if enough people are sitting down with their sport coaches and having these conversations. And I think they should, Hey, what day is a hard practice or what do you think is a hard day of practice? Cause at times what we believe or what is what sport coaches believe or sports staffs believe is a hard day of practice could be an easy day for athletes and vice versa. Right. Um, yep. So are you kind of sitting down with them and saying like, what is your plan? Let's overview it. Or how does that work for you guys? Uh, for me, I think it's just about finding common ground. Obviously throughout a week, sport coaches have certain things that they want to develop, whether that be technical, tactical skill development, uh, physical qualities, if you want, um, if certainly with the physical qualities, that's when we come in, but um, I think it's more about advocating for what you want to advocate for, having just reason for that and really expanding on that with the sport coach so that you can find some kind of common ground. So just as a simple example, um, this last year, we reduced uh, injury occurrences for our men's soccer team by 44%. That's so that's instances, that's instances of injuries and days missed due to injuries. Um, and, and basically that is us fast tracking the return to play as well. And part of that for what I advocated for was our high speed exposures. So I, I, it was a simple conversation of this is what I believe in based on residual effects. Yeah. I believe we can maintain and build speed throughout the season, regardless if you're at home or on the road. We just as a staff need to work collaboratively together to schedule it so that we don't miss, miss the boat. So I think that's something that they bought into immediately. And that was even whether it was myself servicing it an intern servicing it or an assistant coach on the staff servicing it, um, I would just give them constraints that I would like to see. And again, it doesn't take much. It takes yep. maybe five to 15 minutes max to get this exp- yep. exposures you want to then optimize their practice. And then we saw kind of like the the benefit of that, uh, certainly as the year uh, finished this, this last season. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, reducing that by 44% is... Yes. <laughs> is absolutely insane um and that's fantastic i mean i think that just goes to show like what conversations can do and having a thought out plan can do consistently and then doing it consistently so speaking on that um very curious on your speed development approach um and also like your warm-up approach um and what that looks like in different frameworks that you use because i think everybody uses the ramp protocol and how do we you know, I think it's beneficial, but how do we, how do you kind of do something different? Curious on those two things. So, um, I'll touch on the warm up stuff first. And then if sure. it's okay, we'll go into speed afterwards. So, Absolutely. for the warm up stuff, talking about my experience as a student athlete, um, and certainly if you look at certain practices and certain philosophies, um, mostly talking about correctives here, um, I find a significant time, amount of time is allocated towards preparation without any kind of real benefit or adaptation, which is problematic in my eyes. Um, Because ultimately in the collegiate setting, we don't get a significant amount of time with these kids. We have to be very finite in our approach and we have to move the needle forward to, in a way, justify our job, one, but two, ultimately give the teams a good product, right? So really with that being said, um, I have several alternatives to your standard movement preparation as opposed to like, 
a 15 minute dynamic warm up consisting of butt kicks and karaoke's um, in order to aid in that. So one example I kind of touched on earlier was just the reverse session organization model. So uh, if I have a situation where I'm training a team between games, they're coming in beat up after their game. That's when I will usually flip the script instead of giving their accessories at the end of a session, I will do it at the beginning. Again, low level, we'll talk about localized blood flow, all those things. And then afterwards, giving them their kind of meat and potatoes and then hitting them with their greatest stimulus, but least yep. fatiguing stimulus at the end so that they can go into their competition ready and potentiated to a certain extent. Sure. Uh, another one that I've used is uh, barbell complexes. Mm -hmm. So um, I've used an ascending principle or an intensification principle, depending on the time of year. But that could be something as simple as incorporating three to five movements that you deem uh, are appropriate. And that's from a skill standpoint, you want to touch on on a regular basis and giving them light loads fast uh, in order to do that in a kind of a continuous pattern. So in a way, you're giving kids a ton of exposure to the skills that you want them to improve on. Mm -hmm. You're giving them adequate volume at those particular skills. And ultimately, you can progress them in a manner where they're do hitting it with decent load. So as for a training effect, that's going to be way more beneficial than necessarily just doing butt kicks for 20 minutes, sure. you know? Yeah, yeah. Another one that I've done um, that I've incorporated this year with uh, mostly my sprinters, jumpers, and throwers on track and field um, is our AFSM. So you can argue its validity and its effect all you'd like, but just from a... Uh, a, an excitability standpoint, um, I believe that having them do an incredibly high neuro task prior to the primary stimulus is incredibly valuable. So um, if anybody wants to look up more on AFSM, Cal Dietz is a great resource. There's lots of stuff on his YouTube channel. I'd highly recommend it. But um, basically, I'll have them do anywhere from two to four AFSM um, so that is a band facilitated movement. And from an intense standpoint, I'll have the kids try to get 20, 30, 40 repetitions in a span of five to 10 seconds. Yep. Right. Prior to the, the primary session itself. So there's just a couple examples that I do, uh, from a movement preparation standpoint in order to ultimately get a training effect and being as efficient with our time as possible. Yeah, absolutely. Cause the time constraint for us is, is the big thing, right? I mean, yes. You get 45 minutes, you get an hour, you get 30 minutes. Heck, sometimes you might only get 15 minutes, right? I mean, it just kind of depends. Every day is a little bit different um, from that aspect. And, and us nerds who love to train and we're like, if I could have you in the gym every day, I would. But, you know, realistically speaking, we recognize like, hey, you know, uh, we got two times a week with you. We have three times a week with you, whatever the case may be. So how have you really um, – so using those different methods, because I've seen them. I mean, I've – seen the stuff on the Instagram and I think it's fantastic, but, um, how, how do you notice your athletes respond to that? Like when they do the FSM stuff, when they do, you know, some of the other things prior to, do you notice that like they really respond well, whether that's just, Hey, we enjoy this or, um, we're seeing, you know, the adaptations that we want. Yeah. So I'll do kind of a mixed method approach sometimes. And I think even just communicating with our athletes is a vital part of the process. So I'm not sure about yourself, but certainly when I was a, a student athlete, I wasn't overly informed um, of our blocks of the training goals or even of a, of a particular goal of a training session, which mm. I think mm. is, it was really problematic. So yep. going from a student athlete to then a practitioner, that's something I was hell bent on doing. So I keep the kids very, very informed. That's why I use very simple titles like a regen day, a perform day, a turbo day, something along those lines so that the kids know uh, the intent of the given day. Even with my wrestlers, I give them a really simple principle of a hardware software. We train Tuesday, Thursday, we go hardware software. So coming off a competition on the weekend, they know coming in on Tuesday, listen, this is just a volume day. I do not need to be aroused. I don't need to be raw, raw right now. I'm just going to be very methodical, do what I need to do and leave. That's not going to be as mentally exhausting for the kids. Come Thursday, they now know, okay, we're hitting it. I need to come with some juice to the session. That's very, very valuable. So in terms of yep. having the kids respond to those things, I play around with different concepts a little bit to see when it comes, certainly with track and field, 
how every individual performs 24 hours later, 48 hours later. And I'll mark, listen, you are an excellent responder to overcoming isometrics. You are an excellent responder to ISO contrast sets. You are an excellent responder to AFSM. And I'll just kind of flag it to a certain extent and then just go from there. And then give them the autonomy like you talked about earlier to say, hey, like if you want to do this today, great. If you want to do this other thing today, great. Um, exactly. I do a similar I do a similar thing. Um, and I'm very fortunate because what I do is I, I actually steal some of their time, if I'm being honest with you. Um, I do educational sessions with my athletes and what I do, and this is primarily for basketball, but we sit down and we actually go over the the training block. Um, and this just isn't just training, but it's education for life skills. Um, yeah. we take a, we do about two slides depends on the day, but, uh, we probably do it once, uh, preseason, we were doing it a lot off season, a lot in season, not so much because we, we have other things that are more important, but we talk about leadership principles. We talk about examples. We talk about nutrition. We talk about sleep. We talk about all things recovery, performance related. And then we're like, let's talk about today's training session or let's talk about this next week's training session for the sole purpose of educating the athletes and getting them to, you know, take a personal responsibility approach to their uh, recovery and their performance as well. Um, and then to educate them when they leave with me after X amount of years, after they graduate, that they have the confidence in themselves that they can still train. They know how to sleep. They know how to eat. They can refer back to the, you know, whatever the case may be, they get access to everything that I give them anyways. So if they ever have a question on it, um, they can go back and look at it. And we, like I said, it's still about 15 minutes of their time. And it's actually, it's been so beneficial um, for the kids that think about it. You know, they're texting back, coach, we just talked about this leadership thing in class. And I thought about our meeting and I'm like, that's awesome. Like, that's fantastic. Oh, that's like, phenomenal. You, yeah. They're like, can you send me this resource? And I'm like, absolutely. Like, and I think it's just been really beneficial and that's just their objective feedback, obviously. And, um, but I think that's, it's just been so good. And like I said, it's one or two slides, um, 15 minutes, nothing crazy. And it's just, here are what macronutrients are and here's what we should consume and why, right? Like if you have a registered dietitian, obviously have them do that. But if you don't, you have to take the onus on yourself um, and, and say, I need these athletes to be eating X amount of calories every day. And here's why, you know? Um, and a lot of them are shocked by it. Yeah, I think, I, I mean, I think that's a, a really important thing to incorporate. Again, just informing the athletes is just, yeah. is half the battle, right? And you're going to, you're going to get so much out, more out of it. Like just taking one step back to take two steps forward, I think mm -hmm. is a vital part of the process. And certainly the nutrition piece, I don't know on your end, but my end, uh, unfortunately, we're not in the position to provide the kids with a ton of food, for example, yeah. but even, even just informing them on how they can improve their day to day yep. is, is incredibly important. It's one of the things that I actually took from the guys at USC, um, mm -hmm. is kind of like a micro dosing kind of principle on the lecture component, similar to what you said, like 15 minutes, yep. it's not yep. much. You're going to, you're going to play with their attention spans a little bit, but every day is like three to five minutes of, okay, let's talk about this simple concept and how you can improve it. Yep. And if I'm being a hundred percent honest and transparent, I stole that from TCU when I was there. Because oh, nice. they, <laughs> Yeah, they did it after their session, man. I'm not going to lie. And I was like, wow, this is fantastic. So they would work out and then they would have the TVs up there and they'd be like, okay, let's talk about this, you know, for five minutes. Okay, cool, yeah. go. Right. And it was like, man, that was fantastic. Now, was that the reason why they went to the national championship? Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. But I saw something that I liked and I was like, this is awesome. Let me apply this with my guys. And you know, obviously I make it my own, but then I just apply it with my guys. We do it before session because it gives them a little time to just mentally sit there and hang out because after session, we're going right to practice. So, but if you can do that, I would recommend it. I think it's awesome. Um, yeah. It doesn't mean that it's perfect, but I think, you know, the aspect of things is, is really good. Um, one last thing, and then I want to be respectful of your time here, but you're really interested in like your like internship curriculum. Um, how you kind of tier that, uh, I run the internship curriculum here as well, but, um, how you kind of tier that, um, and what that looks like, how you take somebody that's 
a beginner, aspiring SNC coach, somebody that's done an internship before, somebody that's, hey, you're a graduate student level, and then like, bro, you're ready to to be on your own. Like, what does that look like for you guys? So, so yeah, I run the internship program at SFU, and we're very fortunate to have a very strong kinesiology program, and we have a fairly close relationship with them. So uh, basically every semester we'll get a new crop um, of kids from that. That's going to be a course requirement from them to complete. Okay. That will basically be our tier one. Now, those kids are generally very, very green, certainly when it comes to um, understanding exercises, executing exercises, um, shoot, even, even looking you in the eye, they're pretty green. Yeah. Um, <laughs> now, outside of that, um, outside of that, we do have uh, kind of a, a second level where these are people who have been a part of our internship. They've gone through our practicals, whether that be a lecture series or a physical component. And then our level threes are going to be uh, people who are basically what we refer to them as like senior interns or junior coaches, where if I need to leave the room and have a conversation with a coach, if I need to be at practice, if I need to be doing administrative things or talking to our admin upstairs, I'm fully confident that these kids would be able to execute the session, do all the monitoring, do all the data entry to a high level uh, without me having to worry. Now, with when it comes to managing those kinds of three levels, we do run um, about five total hours per week of education opportunities oh, wow. on top on top of their um, on top of their servicing. Um, and now with that kind of level system, we generally tier that as well. So the level ones, um, I need them servicing as much as possible and I need them at every single lecture because they need to intake yep. uh, an abundance of information fairly quickly. The yep. level twos and level threes, I have them applying more. So the, the, the dynamic changes quite a little bit. So I'm actually not going to be on the whiteboard or on the screen. They are. So I will give them case studies. I will give them projects. I will give them all these things to apply because that's how it was when I was an intern. I would sure. basically be applying all these concepts and have my stuff ripped to shreds and torn up over and over yeah. again and fail and fail and fail and fail until I felt strong enough where I could at least argue my logic confidently sure. and communicate yeah. it clearly. And that's ultimately what I want is if you can have clear logic execute it and then actually apply it correctly then you you've earned my confidence yeah. so and have, and, and have the why behind what you're doing too i think that's a huge correct. component of it i'm doing this because of x y z w with the thought process of i'm trying to get x adaptation over x period of time or whatever the case may be if you can like state that out or i've read that information from so and so in this book or this article like okay yeah cool you know? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think that part, that, that part of the process is really, uh, really important to our internship program. So that way, kids aren't repeating certain lectures, they understand these components, and then they can go and apply it. And then ultimately, they are, they're allowed to get behind the wheel to a certain extent, and actually apply it. And I'll, with certain groups, um, allow them to actually program to a certain mm -hmm. extent, as long as it's monitored on my end, I'm okay sure. with it. Uh, and I give it the approval, but yeah, um, I've given the, the level three or the tier three a, a fair bit of freedom in that regards. So yeah. that's generally how we structure it. And it's been fairly successful pro uh, so far, and even in terms of retention. And then going back to our kind of our private model where we are focusing on rev gen a little bit. Um, so we'll have like a local baseball team come in in the evenings and weekends, for example, and it'll be our tier three interns running it. And yeah. it'll allow them to actually make a bit of money. So these are kids who are either post grad or young in their careers looking for opportunities where they can come in and earn 45 an hour, 60 an hour. Sure. Yeah. Right. So that's, that's a fantastic opportunity for them. So I think that tiered system has worked really well for us thus far. That's, that's, that's really interesting. So how many, um, interns do you typically have at one time? Because if you got people from the, the graduate component of it that are really green, and then you got, you know, your next level, and then like, so how many interns do you think, well, how many are you juggling at, at like one time? Uh, I would say anywhere from about 12 to 20. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's, that's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> that's a lot. Yeah. 
I think a lot of people are happy if they have two. <laughs> I mean, we have, we have a, money. we have a lot of help. <laughs> that's awesome. I mean, so that, yeah. that definitely helps the entire aspect of what you guys do flow really well then. Well, yeah, absolutely. And certainly in the spring, like there's, there's certainly the weight room component, but obviously as the, the weather improves, things like that, myself and Chris are on field constantly. We're in meetings constantly. Um, so it's really nice to be able to leave and focus on things that are during this time of year, it's certainly leading to the summer and spring is ultimately speed development and, and, and game speed. Yeah. Right. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's really, really important. So how do you guys last, let's go last topic here, but how do you guys develop speed for your athletes? And I know we kind of talked about bucketing athletes a little bit, but what does your speed aspect look like? Um, you know, if you, you reduced injuries by 44%, it's not by coincidence. Um, and that was with men's soccer who, you know, is on the field running, um, jogging, walking, doing all that stuff. What is your guys' speed development, whether that's in the weight room, out of the weight room? How does that comport work for you guys? So for me, my general philosophy when it comes to speed development um, is kind of a, a pyramid effect. So at the bottom of the pyramid is my prerequisite foot strength. Uh, this is most applicable to track and field, my sprinters, jumpers, and throwers. Um, and it certainly is applicable to field sports as well. But um, generally I will incorporate, uh, during this time when the weather isn't as good, uh, a lot of indoor stuff. So I'll implement Chris Corfis spring ankle stuff. So okay. it is a kind of a, a barrier system where you have to go from level one to a level two to a level three. And that is our prerequisite foot strength. If we ignore those steps, certainly when we're working on mechanics, in addition to that, uh, and I had them go right away, I generally see uh, an abundance of energy leaks, which obviously when it comes to finite uh, mechanics and outputs is super, super important. Uh, the second level, level of that pyramid is our leg action, then arm action, then the high speed exposure management of itself. So okay. really we can train speed year round. We intend on training speed year round. Um, so when we are in our winter months, we're indoors, we're working on our prerequisite foot strength, we're working on mechanics, we're working mostly on like the hardware components of speed. So that could be um, extensive jumps, that can be extensive bounding patterns, things like that to build the, the tissue and the tensile strength of that lower limb. Yep. And certainly the coordination component of as well. Um, arm action, sure, but uh, I think arm action, it's, it's not necessarily gonna get you faster, but can sure shit get, get you slower. And then uh, <laughs> as the weather gets better, then that's more or less when the periodization component comes into it, the readiness component comes into play, or we're managing our high speed outputs, which having Browers, having free laps, having all these things is vitally important so that we can have live information. So we can have a general dose of low, mid and high speed exposures to a certain degree. But similar to what you said with ranges, we have a range of high speed yards or meters that we want to give our sure. kids, but the live information will allow us when we cut them off and when we allow them to keep going. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's really unique from the, the aspect of the, your pyramid, speed development pyramid. Um, cause inside of one of those, you can spend so much time just working on leg action coordination and, you know, you break yep. down acceleration versus max velocity. And then you're like, you, th there's so much to it. And I think speed is becoming a more popular thing, which is awesome. Yep. Um, cause if you look at sport, what do they do? They sprint, they stop, they change direction, they jump and they land nine out of 10 times, right? That's pretty much the majority of all sports. So let's probably spend a lot of time doing that. And typically your fastest athletes are your strongest athletes and typically the ones that make the most amount of impact when it comes to the sport itself. Now we love people that look good in the weight room because we're weight room junkies, if you will. But um, a lot of times we've, those people that are the best in the weight room typically don't play, or if they do play, they don't have as much of an impact um, compared to the, the athletes that, are really good on the field and that typically aren't the best in the weight room, right? I think we've seen that time and time again, and it's just very interesting, but a lot of coaches don't want to do the speed stuff. They don't want to do the field stuff. They don't know it. They don't understand it. I think it's getting better, which is fantastic. <clears throat> I'm not perfect by any means, but it's stuff that I'm very interested in and definitely like improving my skill set on that. Um, and I think so many people have, done a great job of pushing that forward because that's literally sport yeah and i find that really interesting because 
I find, again, like the whole landscape in Canada and having to be a little bit of a jack of all trades, I think it's vitally important to not just be a PhD in the weight room. Um, I think having a a firm understanding of the relationship between the two is vitally important. How we utilize the weight room, certainly in the spring and summer months to transfer really well into the qualities that we want to see. And then going into the bucketing of athletes, obviously, if we if we are going to be using an example like football, they are generally tend to spend the entire uh, winter and early spring doing a lot of compressive movements. And I think identifying patterns of whether they need to be uh, utilizing more hip dominant or knee dominant things, whether they need to work on their acceleration, whether it's max velocity, whether it's just simply an exposure effect. I think having a system where you can categorize and bucket athletes uh, is vitally important. Yep. I agree with that. And and I would say almost every sport besides football here in the United States is, you know, one person strength show where, you know, Hey, you, you are going to have to be the jack of all trades. Uh, You are going to have to know how to do agility training, uh, speed training, um, obviously the weight room component of things, but you know, then the, the injury reduction, the RTP process, right? Like for basketball specifically, like I'm a, I'm a one man band, you know, um, yeah. which forces, I think that's fantastic because it forces you to know all of it forces you to have philosophies on all of it. It forces you to say, how do I get all of this in my training program at one time? How do I individualize this? Who needs help with that? I think it forces you to think through so much more which is extremely beneficial. And if I can get five minutes, 10 minutes before practice and we're doing, um, you know, um, high intensity sprints or we're doing, you know, something for speed exposure because maybe we didn't get it in practice or maybe we have a 10 day gap between games or whatever the case may be. Hey coach, can I get 10 minutes? That's it. We're going to do five reps. You know, it's going to look like we're not doing much, but I promise we're doing what we need to be doing and you know, okay. Yes. Awesome. Sweet. Thanks. You know, so um, I think there's a lot of benefit to having one person rather than having five, but I also think, you know, there's benefits to having five than just one, two, right? Obviously everything has its pros and its cons, but. Yeah, certainly every, every, every situation is a little bit different, but I think overall the needles moving forward a little bit in terms of the prioritization of speed and sporting yeah. demands, not necessarily just strength. Uh, yep. In my opinion, it is, it's not that hard to get somebody strong. I think, one's ability to connect the dots and transfer is something that is, uh, is a lot, is a lot more challenging and should be uh, touted. Yeah, absolutely. Right. So anything you want to uh, end on here? Um, on my end, no, I'm all good. Uh, I just appreciate the time. And, uh, I mean, certainly if anybody wants to connect with me, I'm all ears. Um, probably the best way to reach out to me is via social media. Uh, you yeah, guys can find me at uh, at Coach Care, so Coach Dot Care. Um, mm-hmm. That'll probably be the best way to get a hold of me. Um, mm-hmm. If anybody does want to uh, touch base uh, regarding their practice or things that I incorporate, uh, I'm always happy to chat, and I will be producing some uh, some seminars online uh, that will be available for purchase in the coming months. So, looking forward to hopefully connecting more with yourself and, and other people. So, yeah, I just appreciate the time. Yeah, absolutely, man. Hey, if you guys aren't following uh, Coach Care on Instagram, go follow him. Um, and if you want to continue to learn from somebody that I believe is, is one of the up and coming young coaches in the industry, I would highly recommend doing that, reaching out to him, getting in communication with him, uh, go to his webinars, um, go to his seminars, get involved with him because I think he brings a lot to the table. And I think you guys learned something, um, you know, throughout this hour and 15 odd minutes of us talking. Speaking of that, If you did like today's episode um, and you got value from it, do me a favor, share this with one person. Um, Hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, drop comments. Um, This will be going on YouTube and then all of the podcast aspects. So drop comments, tell them what a great job he did. Um, And then lastly, and most importantly, um, subscribe to my email uh, newsletter where you're going to get updates on who is going to be on the episodes next and some other exclusive offers and stuff. So if you guys like this, like I said, please do that. Share with one person. Would really appreciate that. Coach, thanks for your time today. Uh, Really appreciate you being on and look forward to having more conversations with you in the near future. Yes, sir. Looking forward to it. Thanks so much, Kendrick. Yeah, thanks, brother. Appreciate you.